Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and chapter 7. I'm just taking one verse out of chapter 7 as an introduction, and then back to the second half of chapter 6. But chapter 7, verse 10, I'm reading it from the Living Bible, it says, Don't long for the good old days, for you don't know whether they were any better than these. Don't long for the good old days, because you don't know if they're any better than these. Let's consider 100 years ago, the year 1917. What difference a century makes? The life expectancy for men at that time was 47 years old. Fuel for cars was sold in drugstores only. Only 14% of the homes had a bathtub. 8% of the homes had a telephone. The maximum speed limit in most cities was 10 miles per hour. The tallest structure in the world was the Eiffel Tower. The average U.S. wage in 1910 was 22 cents an hour. The average U.S. worker made between $200 and $400 a year. A competent accountant could expect to make $2,000 a year. A dentist would make $2,500 a year. Now you go to the dentist, it's $2,500 just for a tooth implant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a veterinarian would make between $1,500 and $4,000 a year. And a mechanical engineer would make up to $5,000 a year. More than 95% of all births took place at home. 90% of all doctors had no college education. Instead, they attended so-called medical school. Instead of attending so-called medical schools, many of which were condemned in the press and the government as unsubstandard. And so a lot of the barbers did a lot of the medical stuff. Sugar cost four cents a pound. Eggs were 14 cents a dozen, a little over a penny apiece. Coffee was 15 cents a pound. Most women only washed their hair once a month. Oh my. And they used borax or egg yolks for shampoo. Canada passed a law that prohibited poor people from entering into their country for any reason. hundred years ago. You know what the five leading causes of death were back then? <sighs> Pneumonia and flu. Tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Diarrhea. Mm. Heart disease. And stroke. Patriotically, the American flag only had 45 stars. The population of Las Vegas, Nevada, 100 years ago, 30. Oh my. Crossword puzzles, canned beer, and iced tea hadn't been invented yet. There was neither a Mother's Day nor a Father's Day. Two out of every ten adults couldn't read or write, and only 6% of all Americans had graduated from high school. Marijuana, heroin, and morphine were all available over the counter at a local corner drugstore. Back then, pharmacists said heroin clears the complexion, gives buoyancy in the mind, regulates the stomach, bowels, and is in fact a perfect guardian of health. 100 years ago. 18% of households had at least one full-time servant or domestic help. There are about 230 <coughs> reported murders in the entire USA. Now I have about 230 reported murders in Detroit or Chicago. <laughs> in our day and age. But the question comes up, you know, we are always talking about the good old days. We're going to continue in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We left off in verse 8. That said, wise men and fools alike spend their lives scratching for food and never seem to get enough. Both have the same problem, yet the poor man who is wise lives a far better life. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mere dreaming of nice things is foolish. It's chasing the wind. All things are decided by fate. It was known long ago that each man would, uh, what each man would be. So there's no use arguing with God about your destiny. The more words you speak, the less they mean. So why bother to speak at all? If these few days of our empty lifetimes, who can say how one's days can best be spent? 
Who can know what will prove best for the future after you're gone? For who knows the future? We've got old Gulliver here, and last time we spoke about being tied down, we find life is tied down to drudgery according to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 6 verse 8. Thank God for dirty dishes, they have a tale to tell, while others are eating, we're doing very well. One day I complained I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. Life tied down to the earth is drudgery. And ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, it was said that a woman would have pain in childbirth and a man would work at the sweat of his brow. And that was exactly what happened. And that was the promise we had. What advantage have the wise over fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? And it says how to break loose that binding. Essentially Solomon made the process of breaking the cords clear. He talks about breaking and loose these binding cords. And one of the first things we want to consider is that the first step requires that I stop trusting in a dream of the future and take a sober look at now. It's good to be a realist, but it's good to also be a dreamer. But uh, being a dreamer is wonderful, but then look at reality. On a trip, I was reading through, and I've never read the book. Have you ever read the book, Profiles and Courage by John F. Kennedy? How many have ever read this book? Some have, some haven't. Here's a man. His name was... John Quincy Adams. He says, 36 years I have served as a United States Senator, Harvard professor, and American minister to major European powers. And this is what he wrote in his diary. He said, I'm 45 years old. Two-thirds of a long life have passed. And I have done nothing to distinguish it by usefulness to my country and to mankind. Passions, indolence, weakness, and infirmities have sometimes made me swerve from my better knowledge of right and almost constantly paralyze my efforts of good. Some years later, at the age of 70, he says, Having distinguished himself as a brilliant Secretary of State, an independent President, an eloquent member of Congress, he was to record somberly that his whole life has been a succession of disappointments. I can scarcely recollect a single instance of success in anything that I ever undertook. Boy, oh boy. And yet in his lifetime, which was so bitterly deprecated by its own principle, has never been paralleled in American history. John Quincy Adams, until his death at 80 in the Capitol, held more important offices and participated in more important events than anyone in the history of our nation. Minister to The Hague, emissary to England, minister to Prussia, state senator, United States senator, minister to Russia, head of the America mission to negotiate peace with England, minister to England, secretary of the state, president of the United States, and a member of the House of Representatives. He figured in one capacity or another in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the prelude of the Civil War. Among the acquaintances and colleagues who march across the pages of his diary are Sam Adams, a kinsman, John Hancock, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Lafayette, John Jay, James Madison, James Monroe, John Marshall, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Hart Benson, Benton, John Tyler, John C. Calhoun, Daniel Webster, James Buchanan, William Lloyd Garrison, Andrew Johnson, Jefferson Davis, and many others. Wow. And he yeah, says, I can scarcely recollect a, a single instance of success in anything that I ever undertook. 
think by age six he could speak six foreign languages. Wow. That's right. That's right. By the age twelve. Uh, it's absolutely uh, incredible. What in the world? And yet, this is the way the man looked at life. And Psalm was looking at life himself. We look at him as the writer of Proverbs. We look at him as the richest king. We look at him as the wisest man ever lived on the face of the earth. We look at his wisdom in Ecclesiastes. We look at him as a success story. And it's this man, Solomon, that says, you know, stop trusting in a dream of the future and take a sober look at now. Life is absolutely meaningless. It's totally worthless. It's a vanity of vanities. It's utterly a fluff of cotton candy and a chasing after the wind. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 6 9, better with the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless and a chasing after the wind. What you have in front of you is better than what's out there. We have an expression in American idiom. A bird in the hand is better than what? Two in the bush. A job you have now, a sale price you have now, an item you have now is better than what you might think you might have. I remember when I was growing up and in college, mom gave me some advice because I had one of these deals that said, mom, I need some money. I'm going to buy a car and I need some help. And I borrowed from her like $235 help buy my first car. I had some deposit, and it was five or $600 buy my first car. But I needed to borrow from her $235. And this was mom's advice to me. When you want something so bad, work a second job. Amen. Or sell what you have to buy what you think you want. If you've got to work a second job, and get rid of something you've already had that's already been paid for, then you look at what you think you want. And then do you really want it? <laughs> better what the eye sees, better to have that bird in the hand than the roving of the appetite that is meaningless and a chasing after the wind. The Bible tells us in another translation, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. There's a wealthy man that had a very nice house. And uh, because they had a big house, they had a big yard. And since they had a big yard, they had to hire yard maintenance people. And then the wife, because she had such a big house, had to hire maids. There's so much infighting among the maids and so much infighting among the yard maintenance crew and the yard people and the groundskeepers that the husband and wife finally got together and said, okay, let's reevaluate our situation. Our maids are stealing from us. They're bickering and fighting. Our groundskeepers, every time you turn around, they're either breaking up equipment or busting up equipment or they're just fighting with each other and arguing over, over a bunch of nonsense. So they fired the groundskeepers, fired the maids, plural. She decided to do the housework from then on and he decided to do the yard work from then on. And then when you get that big of a house, you start wondering, is the house too big? Right. When I was growing up, I had two and three quarters acres we used to mow with a push mower. We had two fireplaces. We had to stoke and cut the firewood and bring it in when it was cold outside and chase the palmetto bugs out of the wood pile before we brought them into the house. And my dear, dear wife says, Honey, when I get married, it wasn't a white picket fence, when I get married, I want a big yard and fireplaces. I hated fireplaces. We shivered in front of fireplaces trying to get dressed, ready to go to school. I was wrapped up in three and four and five army blankets to try to wool army blankets to try to stay warm. I'd get under my covers with a flashlight and read a Tarzan book or a Hardy Boy book by a flashlight with a bunch of like a cocoon with blankets over me. So much is my thinking about it. 
And so whenever we went off to college, mom well, got the gas log. She stuck inside the gas, you know those gas log things that you just light the pilot and pop. And you got heat. And you know what mom did when we all left, went to college, all of us? She went and bought a riding lawnmower. Uh, of course. <laughs> what state was that? Florida, Orlando. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Two and three quarter acres. I shouldn't tell you about that. The second step that Solomon had and offered is this. We must stop fighting the things that are not ours to change. Whatever exists has already been named and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. There is the prayer. I thought this was the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. But apparently the serenity prayer was written by Reinhold Neubauer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, sometimes we have had tools walk away from job sites down in Jamaica. And it happens. We've had tools walk away from the job site right here. They either get damaged, broken, burnt out, with either carelessness or they just the tools ready to die and happen to die in the guy's hands that were doing them. But we can get out, we can get a group of ten Jamaicans and we got one guy that's a thief and in Jamaica they say thief from thief, God laughs. When a thief steals from a thief, God laughs. That's a Jamaican uh, patois expression. And we can get down and get ten Jamaicans together and ream them out because one guy among them was a thief. And that's not being fair, that's interpreted that these white, imperialist, know-it-all Yankee white guys from America come in trying to tell us Jamaicans how to do our work and how to live our lives. And they don't know what it's like to live in Jamaica like we've lived in Jamaica. And so we found the, 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 it's better to have a Jamaican correct a Jamaican than have an American go in there and try to correct a Jamaican. But we uh, decided to do the Sears Roebuck plan. You know what the Sears Roebuck plan is? They know that employees are going to steal. They know that, uh, uh, that customers are going to steal. And they're going to know vendors are going to steal. You know how vendors will reel in 10 cases of Pepsi Cola? Actually, there's nine cases. They're selling the other case to their friends. Vendors steal more, and employees steal more than customers. Though you hear always about the customers. But employees steal a lot more. And vendors steal a lot more than customers steal. So Sears Roebuck has built into their price structure 2% to cover loss through theft, through shoplifting, through damage, inadvertent damage. Somebody runs a tow motor over some guttering that's supposed to go out on the delivery truck. So I decided whenever we're giving these guys uh, money for buying additional cement blocks and there to bring us receipts. He says, brother, here's $500 to buy 500 cement blocks. Oh, thank you, brother, brother Richard. Thank you, Sister Sandy. They don't know it should have been $600 for 600 cement blocks. But we had to hold back $100 to make up for damage, carelessness, tool loss, and other things that happened on the job. And if you factor that in, then you don't have to raise a bunch of sand and chew people out and blame other people for things that they aren't really guilty of. And that's what we call the cost of doing business. Change the things you can change except the things you can't change. We get in on the airline and you end up, they say, oh, your suitcase is overweight. And so we normally, our carry-ons are supposed to be 30 pounds? Well, on this airline it was 22 pounds. So he didn't bring our grocery bag, you know, like our cloth bag you're supposed to bring. Next time I'm going to bring the cloth bag. We had to take the heavy laptop computer and put in a plastic bag we were carrying our granola bars in. And what I don't understand is we're stuffing our underwear and our, our books and our computer in a plastic carry bag, tote bag to lighten up so we're 22 pounds for the overhead. 
Then as soon as we get over the gate, we're taking the computer and sticking it back in there to stick it back in the overhead. Because whether you're carrying it here, carrying it there, carrying it on the seat, that weight's still on the plane. Yep. And they're playing these games. It used to be 70 pounds until they had lady baggage handlers. Does it do any good to complain? How many international incidents do you have when somebody rips the handle off your suitcase for the umpteenth time? We had one of our nicest suitcases, the handler just took the handle, slung around and ripped it off. Do you complain about it? Does it do any good? No. Because when you get to Jamaica, they said it was the American people on the other end that mishandled the luggage. And if you complain when you get back to America, they're going to say it's the Jamaicans on the island that damaged your luggage. And then you go to customer service, they say, well, the purpose of the suitcase is to protect the contents. Were your contents protected? Well, yes, they were. Well, then we do not guarantee wheels and handles. We only guarantee your contents. Were your contents destroyed or damaged? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, including torn off handles on suitcases. And the courage to change the things I can, like our attitudes, about people that tear the handles off your suitcases. And the wisdom to know the difference. He is man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Man's relationship with God. In the third step, Solomon offered toward casting off bonds is this. We must recognize we can learn much, but even that won't offer you all the answers. I know professional students that are forever going to school, earning degree after degree after degree after degree. Some have been, I know the atheists had one of their guys up here in Tampa campus. That young guy was in the college, I think, going on seven years still working on his bachelor degree. And the only reason he was there is so that the atheist had a voice on the campus. That's the only reason he was there. He's a professional student that just got by and just took a minimum amount of classes just to get by so he didn't have to start paying back his student loans. He can still live at home with mom and dad in the garage and he can still propagate his atheist faith. But here, Solomon's offering, you know, he, he's talking about learning and ever learning and ever learning. But after the dust settles, you know, it's, it's just so much, uh, that won't offer all the answers, being a professional student. He goes on to say, the more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? And I remember, there is a, two speakers got up to speak at Gettysburg. And the one man got up, I think the man was Everett somebody, and nobody even remembers, but he got up and spoke for two hours at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And then Lincoln gets up and he speaks for about two minutes. And they say that Lincoln's speech, he could have done a wedding, the Lord's Prayer, and a funeral all in the same two minutes, if, if he decided to. And yet the man who spoke for two hours, he says, I wish I could encapsulate... <coughs> In two hours, what Mr. Lincoln encapsulated in two minutes. But even the wise man, Solomon, says, The more the words, the less the meaning, and how does that profit anyone? Watch your thoughts, they lead to attitudes. Watch your attitudes, they lead to words. Watch your words, they lead to actions. Watch your actions, they lead to habits. Watch your habits, they form your character, and watch your character, it determines your destiny. And Solomon offered the positive that can unbind the cords of man. In chapter 6, verse 12, he offered two rhetorical questions. For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He has spent the life of it like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? The two questions begin, who knows and who can tell? And both have the same answer. Man's creator, the Lord God. For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone? I want to ask Glenn to help me on this song. This encapsulates an entire life of a father and a son and their particular relationship. Oh, I like it.
I think this shares kind of Solomon and his interpretation on and his slant on life. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. There were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking for a new it, and as ass he grew, he said, I'm gonna be like you, Dad. I'm gonna be just like you. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. A little boy in blue and a man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. But we'll get together then You know we'll have a good time then My son turned ten just the other day He said, thanks for the ball, Dad, come on, let's play Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today I got a lot to do, he said, that's okay And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed, he said I'm gonna be like him, yeah, I know I'm gonna be like him. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, a little boy blue and a man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man I just had to say Son, I'm proud of you, can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys See you later, can I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon The little boy blue and the man in the moon When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when But we'll get together then, son You know we'll have a good time then I've long since retired and my son's moved away I called him up just the other day I said I'd like to see you if you don't mind He said I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time You see my new job's a hassle and the kids got the flu But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad It's been sure nice talking to you and as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me, my boy was just like me. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, the little boy blue, the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. The Bible never once says, figure it out, but it's over and over it says, trust God. He's already got it figured out. But this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Amen. Wisdom from the book of Ecclesiastes. Hallelujah.